Yeah, we have a new business indicator um, right off the square, right next to the old courthouse called Clarity Fitness. The owner is a young entrepreneur, Abby Griffin. She was going to be here tonight. She does a fitness, her fitness program also includes body positive messaging. So her, her position on fitness is that it is whatever is healthy for you, not healthy by a certain standard, digital standard, et cetera. So she's going to become, a, uh, I think, an integrated partner with us. So we think that's a great resource for us to share. Today. So we wanted to shout out some of the people that already work with Decatur Parents Network also, but also with our uh, City Schools of Decatur uh, partnerships. We have Pathways has a table in the back. We have uh, Pathways people up here, but also in the back, some more Pathways people, including Lindsay. Um, I knew I knew the last name. Soder. Soder. Lindsay Soder, raise your hand back there because for you Tally Street people, through our partnership with Pathways, she is in this building. She's here um, at Tally Street working with individuals or families as a therapist. So uh, we have some really great partnerships going with all of City Schools at Decatur that I think a lot of people don't know what's going on everywhere across the board. And now I'm going to turn it over to um, Peter. Who's going to take over the next part? Okay. All right, so you're here for Impact of Tech on Youth Resilience. We've created this Venn diagram to, to show you the intersections or to illustrate the intersections of neuroscience, physical health, social media, self, and school, how those intersect uh, around tech, around technology use. So we use the word impact, um, and we intend the program to be a discussion of how technology influences you. And this influence could be positive, negative, or neutral. As caregivers, our highest concern might naturally be on what negative impact technology in 2020 has on our children. But this technology also offers positive and constructive access, instruction and entertainment. The best way to measure the impact it has is with a sense of balance. And the American Psychological Association describes resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of significance sources of stress, such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems, or other stressors. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. Our youth are dealing with expectations and boundaries every day, and at every turn. To them, it's a steady stream of challenges that are often beyond their experiences um, that are faced every day. So tonight's conversation, and we really want it to be a conversation, not simply a presentation, um, Hopefully, will inform us about the stressors our youth are experiencing, how technology can help or possibly hinder their resilience in dealing with that. So, our panel members represent a number of touch points within our community that youth come in contact with. And after I introduce them, each will describe that touch point and what their perspective is on this topic. We'll then present a number of questions for the panel to uh, respond to and discuss from their vantage point. But we invite you into the conversation. Uh, so after a comment might be made, uh, feel free to raise your hand and contribute to the, to the conversation if you want to go deeper into an answer that they're giving or want to pull a little more clarity out of a comment they've made. We invite you to be, we don't want to necessarily wait till questions at the end. We want everything to be happening you know, as, the top, as, the, as the points are being made. Um, we'd also like to continue this conversation past tonight. So um, I think uh, Jen is going to show a slide at some point about uh, the DPN website. So we invite, invite you to come to the DPN website and uh, interact on this topic a little bit more. So our panel tonight, thank you for all for being here. We have Essen Melton, who is the Executive Director of Information Services at City Schools of Decatur. We have Cheryl Lamias, uh, who's the Instructional Coach and IV Coordinator at Decatur High School. We have Lisa Miller, uh, who is an individual and family counselor at Pathways Transition Programs. And we have uh, Maria Halpin, who is the lead school-based therapist at Redan Elementary and Freedom Middle School. And she comes through the DeKalb Community Service Board. And we have Suzanne uh, Cosmerol, who is a social media specialist. Her company is uh, Hashtag Parenting. She talked to us about social media. So I'll let our panel take it from here. <laughs> I, did, I did not come with any particular touch point um, to share just on the, on the front. I, th I think what I would say for now is I hope this can be a conversation um, and that what A, 
a family finds successful or what a family finds as a source of stress is going to very quickly become something specific to your family. Um, there's no one size fits all copy and paste replicable success story. And where you have the other end of the spectrum and you have challenges and frustrations, um, they are unique to your family or to that kid or to that kid that particular year because you know that your kids are different people even multiple times throughout the day. Um, there are a couple of things that I hope I have the opportunity or that I trust the other folks up here would say because um, I think there's a lot of overlap in our perspectives. Um, but rather than just say it at you right now, um, I think the quicker we can get to your questions and be here to serve you, uh, the better. Um, my name is Cheryl Namias. I work at Decatur High School. I have for, this is my seventh year, and before that I was at Renfro for seven years. I have three children, grade six, grade ten, and freshman in college. Um, so I definitely feel like this is a topic close to my heart. I think the way I got my spot on this panel was because Ken Jackson, one of the counselors at the high school, and I do a uh, session on academic stress and I've, some of you have been to that one and this is a piece of that that we talk about but I think my perspective on this whole topic is that you know life is filled with stressors modern life is filled with stressors technology is it is what it is and it's about how it interacts with things that are already there and how it either helps or hurts and I think that you know my perspective is from both a mom, mom vantage, but also just working with teenagers for so long, up and down the spectrum. And so um, I agree with Esten that even within my house, all three children are completely different. And with, I can tell you within a high school, you know, um, so there's no simple answers, but I definitely think there's a lot of wisdom to be gained in just hashing through these topics together. Hi, my name is Lisa Miller. I'm gonna stand, is that yeah. okay with y'all? <laughs> My name is Lisa Miller, and I am an individual and family counselor at Pathways. Um, we, Pathways is an agency um, specifically for mental health, and I'm so excited to be here. I specifically um, am contracted at Claremont Elementary and also Glenwood Elementary. I want to give a huge shout out to uh, my Pathways family. So. Uh, Lindsay was already introduced, Lindsay Soder, who is here. She is a school-based therapist, so if you have children at Tally and you have specific questions, please go see me, see Lindsay. We can get you connected. And also, um, families who have children at Renfro and Decatur High, Miss uh, Danielle Church is back there. She is a school-based um, therapist who goes there. So just a little bit about Pathways. We're located right down the street. I'm sure y'all have um, gone to Chick-fil-A and seen us, that big house across from Greens. So we do um, mental health not only for the children, but we really work as the family system and make sure that we're not working with the child in isolation at school. It's very important, and all of you know that because you're here tonight. So we thank you for taking time to come here. Um, we have intensive family intervention, which I think is something um, really good to highlight, which is a service um, saying, for example, I had a client this week who had to um, go to the hospital for suicidal ideation. So we do a lot of high intense um, different cases, but we also do anxiety, depression, ADHD, and everything like that. So I encourage you to go on our website. I just want to show you this really quickly. Um, this is very interesting. Um, our founder, Dr. Jane, she is fabulous. She started doing this in the 70s and founded Pathways in 1991. And this is a curriculum and program that she has developed. She's a clinical psychologist. And I'm, just, I'm not going to go all the way into this, but my perspective on this is really on the self and educating parents on what the students and the clients innately have from birth. So there's a lot of different... Um, protective factors out there and environmental stressors and it's really good to take it a step back and look at the self and developmentally how that the technology can impact. So go on our website, I'm not going to bore you with all this, but I want you to look at the different um, growing children so it's all the way from birth to five and the progression all the way to the adult. So we'll get into more of it later. 
But thank you so much for inviting me to be here, Peter. Okay. Um, and I am Maria Halpin, um, therapist with the DeKalb Community Service Board. We offer a lot of similar um, services as Pathways. Um, we are also here in Tally. Um, we have a school-based therapist here, but most of our schools are in DeKalb County. Um, so I was going to touch on mainly four concerns um, with technology and mental health. Things that I'm seeing, things that I'm hearing, especially in the middle school. Um, the first is increased anxiety. So there are tons of thoughts, tons of things that, that the kids have come to me. Um, what am I posting? How are people going to respond to my posts? Um, am I getting these socially validating likes and comments that I want? Um, so that's, and of course, FOMO. I'm sure y'all sure have heard of that. The fear of missing out. It is real. They are feeling it. Um, and as well as I hear this one a ton, um, kids get their phones taken away as a consequence, right? So there's some anxiety with restricting access to social media. And they're sitting there wondering, what am I missing? What are people posting? Are people commenting on my thing now? Um, so that's one, increased anxiety. We've also seen increased symptoms in depression, of depression. Um, so, uh, do you, okay. I was going to ask. Um, so this, I picked this image. Um, I feel like it plays to the increased symptoms of depression. Um, people are posting their best self. They are posting what they want people to, what they want people to think of them, what they want people to think that their life is like. Um, but it's not always accurate. So the kids are getting this kind of constant bombarding of the best of everybody's life and they're comparing what they're posting and what's going on in their life to what they're seeing. Um, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, kind of these social validating um, comments and likes if they are not getting the, what they're expecting, how they're expecting their, their peers to interact with them on social media, then that can cause um, isolation and symptoms of depression as well. Um, the third concern, cyberbullying. Um, I'm not going to go in depth in this, but we know that it is happening and victims um, of cyberbullying can struggle with lowered self-esteem, um, suicidal thoughts, and depression symptoms, isolation as well. Um, and then the last that I have is that really this lack of social interaction, in-person social interaction, I think is really damaging social skills these days. Um, I see a lot of you shaking your head. Kids are not necessarily doing what we did when we grew up, going outside, getting involved. Um, I always tell parents the best thing that you can do at this age is get them involved in a club, a sport, some kind of extracurricular activity that's going to really build social skills, build resiliency. Um, get them away from their tablets, the social media, everything. Get them interacting with uh, their peers. Um, so those are, those are the four main concerns that I have seen. Um, of course, there are positives. There, we're able to connect and, and stay connected with our family, friends who live you know, halfway around the world. Um, it, social media can be educational. Um, I know I'm influenced by a lot of things that I buy or that I want to do, buy social media, go on Instagram, check the hotel that I'm looking in, what do the pictures really look like, you know, just all things like that. Um, so there are definitely a lot of good, positive things that, that social media can contribute to our life, um, but it's important for us to know about these concerns um, and kind of how we can approach this and um, help our kids to use social media um, appropriately at this point. Great. Hi everyone, I'm Suzanne. Um, my perspective is a little different from everyone else on the panel. I'm just a mom and I have been working in social media pretty much since it started because I was in marketing and advertising. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the reason I started Hashtag Parenting about two years ago was my son, he was the last one of his friends to get an iPhone, which, you know, I'm the worst mom ever. 
Um, and he immediately got in trouble with it and started doing things he shouldn't have been doing. And I started doing research on what apps they have and how to keep them safe. And it took me hours. And I thought, gosh, if I am having trouble finding this information, I can't imagine how parents who aren't familiar with social media are feeling. So I started that um, company just to educate parents and to help them figure out how to keep their kids safe, what apps they're on, what do the apps do, and all of that stuff. So um, I typically only deal with parents, but I have talked to kids. Um, I've been on panels with kids, which was fascinating. Um, and I've done one-on-one -on -one consultations with families where the kids are there and I get to ask them a lot of questions. So I will say that my perspective has really changed in the last two years because at the beginning I was like militant, like lockdown. But the more I hear from kids and what they're saying, I'm like loosening up a little bit that I'm like, okay, so maybe we just need to monitor and not lock down. So really it depends on the kid. I'm not going to say across the board, but it depends on the kid. And I think that some kids get it and can self-regulate and all that and some can't. Um, so, I just think it's really interesting um, to see the different types and the way it, the way it affects them. Um, so, I wanted to give a positive and a negative. I think a positive is connection, as you mentioned. Um, my son is 16, and I have another son who's 8, um, and he's super shy, my 16-year-old. He would never just go out and go up to someone and go, hey, what's up? And, as you all know, teens are on Snapchat. 24-7. And he has actually met people in the metro area on Snapchat and they've actually gone out and done things like gone to the movies or gone to football games. And I don't think that would have happened had he not been on Snapchat. I think he would have just like hung out with the one guy that he's always hung out with and that would have been it. So I do think there's positives in that way. Um, but the negative that I see right now, which drives me crazy, is the phone never leaves their hand. It's like they've grown an appendage. And that just drives me nuts. And I'm constantly telling my son, put it down, put it down, put it down. And they, it's like they can't help it. It's addiction. Um, so that's my negative. Um, so I'm just here to provide a little bit of different perspective from parents and kids. And um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And one thing I'll add to Suzanne's, I think if you have questions about I think I have connected with Suzanne, connected with Suzanne in the past. But maybe a specific app that I had a question about. My daughter would have said, hey, what about this? And uh, Suzanne is really good about navigating the, uh, the use of the app and sort of peeling back the surface. Because if you do any research into or look into uh, a lot of the apps that are available, some of them are cloaking other behaviors. And they're just sort of a, a surface thing for other things, and others are just simply communication devices. So I invite you, uh, Suzanne might be able to give you some insight on a specific app that maybe you're negotiating with your child. Peter, speaking of apps, I forgot to talk about my slide. Is it okay to put that back up? Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. I wanted to talk about... Uh, so. I have a presentation that I do to parents where we really dive deep into apps, but I want to just kind of combine everything into one slide. So the, the popular apps you see up there, Snapchat's the top one, and then TikTok, and then um, Instagram, and then Kick, and um, WhatsApp are texting apps, and then YouTube. My youngest is a YouTube addict, so I have to kind of shut that down. Um, and then some stats from Pew Research. They um, interviewed 10,000 teens and came up with this data. And I thought it was interesting that there's a lot of positives and negatives. So, you know, feeling more connected, but then overwhelmed by the drama, which I've seen firsthand. So I just thought those stats were interesting to show um, that it's, it really is both sides of the point. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's one of the points we want to make is that there is, that technology is not a monster waiting for our children, but it's a, it's a, it's a thing, it's a tool, it's a, it's a, it's a place to go for things uh, that are really constructive and really positive um, if we're wary about it. If we're we understand it better. So th the first question I'll throw out and, um, is in the past 10 years there's been a 59% increase in teens reporting depressive symptoms. From your vantage point, what does that signal to you looking at that statistic for what needs to be done and how that needs to be addressed? Is this a call to action for you, and what is that action? 
I'll start. Um, I think something that's really important, I see a lot of families that are super reactive. I think having those conversations and educating um, your children and students uh, proactively, not only at home, um, but having those calm conversations, hey, we're going to have time limits on your phone tonight. Have you done X, Y, Z so you can earn your phone? Um, I think having positive rewards is super important, and it's not just negative taking away, taking it away. Um, I think also in schools, having more social-emotional learning programs and initiatives, and um, I used to be a school counselor myself, so I think it's, it's very, very important to be more on the proactive approach, because in the long run, you'll be less reactive. And I do, everybody, get your phone out. You gotta write this down or get your phone out. This is super important. This is like, if I could have one takeaway from the night, I want you to get down that my GCAL, it's uh, my Georgia Crisis and Access Line. It is an app. Has anybody heard of it? Yes, awesome. I'm a mental health counselor, so oh, I have great. it on my site. Good, good. So I, um, I presented at a conference in November and I got to talk to the Georgia Crisis and Access Line um, representative, and she was saying, you know, Lisa, so many parents are taking their phones away when they are thinking about suicide. They're um, feeling depressed, but they could use their phone in this app as a tool in order to talk to a mental health counselor. So if you go on it, it's like a little green app. It's my GCAL. I downloaded it. It's fabulous. I just want to give you that nugget because I thought it was really important. I just want to add on. Oh, sorry, go ahead. My GCAL. So it's G C A L. So Georgia Crisis Access Line. You can Google it too. So uh, it's great. I just wanted to add on to what she was saying about um, kids needing their phone for help. Um, we, I was, as I mentioned earlier, I was on a panel with some high schoolers, and at the time I was very hard line, like the phone goes in the kitchen at 10, you're done, blah, blah, blah. And this girl was explaining how um, the kids call like 3 a.m. the sad hours because that's when kids start reaching out. Um, and she said to me, like, what happens when a kid is suicidal and you've taken their phone? They have no one to talk to. And that really hit me hard. I was like, oh my gosh, I've never thought of that. So, like, my personal way I manage that is I use screen time on the iPhone. And I allow certain apps at certain times because I don't want to leave them without that because it really is their way to communicate. So, I just want to add because that's yeah. it's really interesting to me. I, I want to step in there and say that anything like this we take down um, and all these slides, we, um, different things like that, we will make available on our website through the Decatur Parents Network. So uh, write it down too if you want, but we will add these resources up there to basically where we have the event notification online. Peter, if you're, if you're reading the questions that you sent to us a couple of days ago at the bottom of the list, uh, someone chimed in that there was a Times or an article recently that cherry picked a line from some other more recent study that observed um, that some of those uh, distressing statistics around mental health are not prevalent or uh, outside the United States. That some of those depressive symptoms are local to this nation, but not in other developed parts of the world too. Um, which is not particularly surprising. If your question is, what do we do? I, I think it is it a call to action. I think it is. You know. Item number 7051 that the state of mental health support in this country is in dire need of, of support and strengthening mm -hmm. across the board. Um, so, to piggyback on that, I think like the responses here went straight because we're all here because specifically about devices and technology. But if, if you put Suzanne's slide back up, um, I think. For every one of those things, feeling more connected, more in touch with friends' feelings, overwhelmed by drama, pressure, only to post good things, feel worse about their <laughs> lives, I can point to you a real life example without any technology involved where kids do the things, like compare themselves to others, like say mean things, um, that they worry about college, 
or about career, or they worry, or they got in a fight with their parent this morning in the car, or so then you introduce the phone. So all those things exist. You introduce a phone, and now I can compare myself to even more people 24 hours a day. My mom can text me when she is mad at me in the middle of a class and tell me, because it makes her feel better in that moment to let it off her chest, that she's mad at me. So that fight is no longer just in the car, it's here. Um, I can turn to my friend, and, what'd you get on your test? You got a seven, I got a six. It's constant. So I think like the bigger picture is that all these things exist in life. Comparison is the thief of joy. And now we have something that allows us to do it more often and with more people. So it's not so much that like the phone creates the thing or the, the screens create the thing, it's that they're amplifying oftentimes and that the real root is about the way kids are expected to be in the world and how they develop the tools to no matter what the thing is, whether it's coming at you in real life, whether it's coming at you through a screen, how do you navigate that and how do you have sort of that internal fortitude. And I think a lot of the stuff about being more connected, all of that, if we took all of their screens away right now, you would still have kids who you really need to get them into a club. Mm -hmm. Because they don't naturally gravitate towards a sport or a club or whatever. And they're going to be happier if they're in a club. Mm -hmm. If they have other people that are like them. So I think it's really, like, it's hard for parents because we see these headlines that make, we, we try to draw causality. Oh, it's the phone. Mm -hmm. And so if we can limit the phone, all these other things will fix. Not necessarily, you know. And so I think, like, I want us to just be able to think about kids a little bit more. You know, the, the, the expectations, the world that's around them, it's part, I like to say to the high schoolers, these are not kid problems. These are not teenage problems. These are human problems. Whatever thing you're struggling with right now is happening with every adult at some level. Time management, worrying about the future, worrying about romantic relationships, worrying about relationships with their kid. If you're not worried about your relationship with your mom, you're worried about your relationship with your kid. You know, so we all have it. It's just that we've developed over time more fortitude oftentimes to deal with some things. So. And, and one of the reasons te technology is particularly vexing is that I, I imagine no one here who is a parent now was raised in a household where their moms and dads have set a really good example on how to use the cell phone that was at the kitchen table, right? Like, the, like we are the first generation that we have has to deal with. Yeah. Um, and that, um, you know, and, and we're uncomfortable with that. And, you know, you all are here, parents here, you know, we're, we're looking for solutions. We, we don't have the luxury of the previous generation to lean on as we do with so many other things that yeah. seem um, more mundane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Esther had referenced a, a question we'll get to, uh, we'll dig a little bit deeper into in a little bit, because um, it, it creates a, a sort of a dynamic that uh, uh, we have to sort of settle. <laughs> so we'll get back to that, but uh, I'll throw this question out to you guys. If, if you read the statistic and, and, and immediately, you went, I mean, the topic tonight is technology, so immediately we're going to go to that. But I would say back to you, Paul, if, if you see that in the last 10 years you're raising children, there's been such a huge increase in depressive symptoms in our children. If we, what's our call to action? Is it tech, do we immediately go to technology? What's your thinking? Uh, a couple things. So before we moved to Decatur, we lived in France, and my youngest child was born there. And um, as you said, um, you know, in other countries, they don't, technology like this isn't 24-7. So they have certain cultural rules about phones. You don't have phones at dinner don't have phones at the table, you don't have phones when you're in the car, you don't have phones when you're on public transport, you don't have phones, you're not talking on the phone when you're um, walking on the street. The, actually, when we lived there, the country banned the marketing of phones to children. That's how much they thought about how potentially damaging it could be. The other thing is resiliency um, and, you know, 
any kind of training that they have about teens, anxiety, social media. The other big piece that they mention is resiliency. And so in places like France, in countries like that, where people spend more time with their families, and it's not just time, it's the actual quality and connection with family and extended family and their neighborhoods and their communities where kids feel like they're actually being heard. That's, that there's a trusted adult that they can talk to about what's going on. So they're not so isolated and have to deal with all the modern day stresses that of which technology and social media is part of. And so when you look at trainings in the US about this, resiliency is a big piece. Um, you know, the biggest predictor research-wise of how well a person does as an adult is their attachment. You know, can they, do they have a good attachment with one trusted adult figure in their life that they can turn to when there are problems in their life, you know, where they feel safe with that person? And, it, and it's such that it creates in them that they have that ability, that wiring in their brain that they can then you know, when other stresses come along in their life, and even as an adult, they can turn to other adults and know that someone will be there for them. And so I think talking about resiliency and building resiliency in our kids is a big piece of addressing the stressors of social media and screens. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned France because it was a few years ago that there was a report that, that French businesses were cutting off business emails at 5 o'clock. So we didn't have access to business emails in the evening. So while that's a control that's put on there, if the message is not about the technology, turn your back on the technology, the idea is to turn your face towards something else, turn your face towards your personal life, turn your face towards the, the people you're sitting with. I think if we, um, you know, we can demonize the, the machine itself, or we can emphasize the positive interactions that happen in the absence of the machine. I think that's you know, part of what Essence of point is, is uh, and what your point is, is that we want to create, make sure we're facing the connect, creating a connection between the people and not saying, turn away from the machine. So we need to give them a human interaction as a substitution or as a, you know, as a reinforcing element. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. It's, we are the first generation to have to deal with not, you know, uh, with problem solving on a human level, on a human to human level we reach out to technology to try to solve the problems. And I see my child who's 10 dealing with a, a level of anxiety when an argument has started on, on you know, like, uh, you know, Instagram or wherever it started, um, social media or ever, anywhere. And it, it drives her to a point of anxiety that she doesn't need to be able to reach out or know how to be, have tools to reach out to her, fr her friends or her peers that she's arguing with face to face. Mm -hmm. And we remember what it's like to actually, if you have a fight with your, your friend, to go over there and apologize. And there's not that extra fire between you guys, because it's easy, we know in social media and our, our, um, our uh, platforms we use to deal with stressors now, we get on and, and write about our, our issues online. Um, but we, we are the generation that know what, you know what it's like to talk face to face. So I tell my daughter all the time that if you have an issue with somebody, Please don't go on, uh, you know, your text message app and go and actually talk to your friend who lives across the street or down the street <laughs> and deal with that. She's, I mean, she's like appalled by the idea. Like, I can't talk to her. We're, we're arguing here, and um, yeah, so that's something. That's like my major problem with uh, with anxiety and not having yeah. FaceTime. Actually, not FaceTime, but face-to-face. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, to slip there. Uh, but yeah, the face-to-face time with your with your peers and And it's interesting um, that you say that because we as adults, we have those stressors too. Oh, I was talking to a lovely family. I'm so sorry. I forgot y'all's names already. <laughs> but we, I was talking to y'all earlier about um, how important it is because your children are looking at you and watching you. So being that amazing role model that you are and having, it sounds so simple, but having those conversations with your child, hey, you know what, I got really frustrated today. I saw at work X, Y, Z happen. I mean, you can censor it. But having them know that they're not the only ones and it's 
only them that are feeling the same thing, <coughs> but that you feel it too, and creating a deeper connection, like you were saying. I mean, kids want to know that they're loved. They want to know that um, they have connection. And we, as adults, want all that too. So just being that role model, and like I said, being proactive rather than reactive, um, putting more energy in being that proactive piece, um, I think will go really far in the long run. Mm -hmm. Back to what Vivian was saying about resiliency, and we're talking about technology, that, that connection that we have with our kids and each other. I mean, I'm sure some of you have seen that, like, I forgot my homework at school, or my soccer cleats, or whatever it might be, and there's that easy connection that if we didn't have that connection, they would have to problem solve. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we didn't have that option growing up, right? So there would be the natural consequences. So then maybe in the future they would learn to be more organized. Um, they learn to problem solve. And in working with kids, I work right now a lot, I go into the eighth grade health classes, as I'm from, the sixth grade classes, and we talk about resiliency and grit, and they're like, well, how do we get that if people do everything for us. And so we've been talking more and more about that and challenging them to think about, well, where in your life can you say, hey, mom and dad, or your teacher, or a friend, or a sibling, like, you know, I got this. And then we as parents have to be willing to possibly allow them to fail, or maybe it takes a lot longer to get something done. But if you think about it, for all of us, when we encounter something, how good we feel, and that if we come up to something again, having the um, confidence that we can do that again. And so, you know, linking that to technology, it's like that connection that we can go to somebody else and have them solve that problem, rather than us sitting in it and figuring out or having the natural consequences. Okay. Um, so we talked about, you mentioned anxiety in the continual, and we talked about, um, Emotional, mental health kind of stressors that are happening to our, we think are happening to our, are happening to our children. So, I guess my question is, how do you talk to your child and make suggestions about approach the subject of mental or emotional health without it seeming like another expectation? As an example, I talked to my 18-year-old and I asked him this question. I said, you know, when people are, you know, how does it not sound like you know, when a parent says it to a child? It's a big deal, and it becomes maybe another expectation of I'm not matching, I'm not, I'm not you know, matching up, I'm not healthy enough, I'm not something enough. So, you know, his answer was, well, we talk to our friends. You know, that's where that's where I'm going to find you know a non-judgmental perspective on my bad feeling. Um, so I put it to the panel: How does a parent approach this subject of how are you feeling? without it seeming like a big deal, or that it seems like it's just a natural check-in, that really does work. Um, I think what well, Lisa touched on this about um, um, starting that conversation, being a role model, sharing how you're feeling, what's going on in your everyday life. Um, and then you mentioned non-judgmental. Being non-judgmental, so if, if the kid comes to you and says, um, oh, I'm so upset because blah, blah, didn't like my post or whatever, you know, we might want to, our gut feeling might be, who cares? This is the comment, this is the post. Mm -hmm. But for them, that feeling is very real, and that stressor is very real. So, so by saying that, we can easily just shut them down from wanting to come to us uh, when they really, you know, are feeling very intense feelings or um, have a um, emotional concern. So I would say model and um, validate, validate those feelings. Don't be judge, non -judge or be non-judgmental for them, um, so that they do feel comfortable coming to you guys. I think just add, add to that practice. Like one way to make it not a big deal is if it not to be a big deal. It's right. part of the family routine. Mm -hmm. And I, I I understand that as kids get older and they get torn in many different directions, the chair probably speaks this better. Um, Family routines may be hard to maintain, um, but I imagine it was hard work, well worth investing in. Mm -hmm. um, I have two boys, my two older ones, and then my uh, sixth grader's a girl. 
and she's like the perfectionist. This is a problem that plagues young women uniquely. Not to be sexist here, men, but um, what I notice among teenage women is that they will have an internal standard that's here, and everybody else's standard for them is here. So somewhere between here, like good enough and even great, and here is the misery zone, you know, that they often find themselves. And I noticed very young, my daughter, my sons were like, yeah, whatever. You know, they didn't have that. And then with her, the worry and like the anxiety about things, about pleasing, about doing well on things. Um, I started doing a thing um, with her where I'll talk about things. I have little tricks like um, when she's dreading something or she's worried about it, a test, a game, whatever it is. I'll say like, okay, let's rate it on the misery scale. One to ten. <laughs> One being it's going to be um, the best day of your life. And ten being it's going to be the worst thing that's ever happened to you. How miserable do you think it's going to be? And she'll have to put a number on it. And then I'll make my prediction about how miserable it'll be. And she'll say, it's going to be a seven. And I'll say, it's going to be a four. And then at the end of the day, whatever. But then she goes into the thing like, ha, I'm going to go experience this thing and report back. You know, and then at the end of the day, we debrief and we say like, well, let's talk about it. What was it really? And we always pinky swear you can't lie. You can't make up a number at the end. And I just give that as not as like this is a magic trick, but it's like a way of just talking about things as if like just taking the, the fear out of it. Because I think another thing is when my daughter's worried or any of my kids are upset or a kid in my school, whatever, we take on their worry and we really want to sometimes we feed it. Like sometimes we don't dismiss it. That's also not a good idea. But sometimes we jump right on it and like, oh yeah, this is, you know, what can I do? So kind of just being neutral about it, like it's just a thing. And like it's going to happen. We're going to debrief it. It's a thing. Slowly over time, like that's kind of gone away. I think she just kind of internalized. Like things are going to happen in life. We have to look at it, we have to think about it, and then we have to move through it. And at the end, it's never as bad as what happened in your mind or what you thought. So I think that's just another way of saying making it normal. Have you, have you applied that? You talk about games or events. Have you applied that to like the online or like bringing it back to like the tech world? Is that something? Uh, so I had a FOMO discussion with my daughter the other day because she has a squad of friends that she runs with and they will start out the morning at you know go into the Waffle House and then at 5 p.m. they still just have to be together and I'm like you've been together this whole day and she can't break away to go do something and so we'll talk about so hers isn't so much the screens yet but it's like I can't be away from these friends because it's so important and I really told her I explained to her what FOMO is and how it is a thing that will actually make you not have as good a life. I was like, I don't want you to be in college, in high school, a person who's missing out on all these things in life because of FOMO. And I just explained it to her like, I did that some in high school. I did that some in college and I regret it. I missed out on things because I was so busy trying to be, you know, in my pack or in my crew or whatever. So um, not so much with the online stuff, but I definitely think normalizing, these are real things. There wouldn't be an acronym for it if it wasn't a real thing, you know, and just talking through. Um, and sometimes she'll bristle at me, but I'm like, hey, I'm just telling you, you know. I mean, they will bristle at you because you're their parent. If some other parent said it to her, she'd think it was wisdom dropping down. <laughs> so, you know. yeah. I think those experiences are amazing. I think it also can happen organically. Um, sometimes when I'm doing some family sessions or just a parent session, um, say you're driving in the car, right, and you're about to run out of gas, and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm about to run out of gas. Relate that to an example of, like, my emotional bank account is almost to empty. And I feel blank because blank. And you will be surprised how your child is like, oh, my gosh, I feel that same way, too. Can I tell you what happened at school today? So making it not seem like you're, like, attacking, like, so how do you feel? It's more organic. 
Um, even like with the little kids, um, I do like a lot of play therapy and games, like playing Uno and the blue card is going to be a time that you felt sad. Yellow is a time that you felt happy. So just like regular things that you do in your life, it sounds so simple, but like all the things, like your Jiminy Cricket, make it out loud, make it a voice. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, and it's amazing how kids will just organically open up to you. Um, I just want to add a couple things on the communication. Um, that theme runs through everything I do because I'm really pro proactive. Um, and I tell people, you know, start talking to your kids when they're five about the online world and social media. They may not get it, but if you start then, the conversations are a lot easier later. Um, but two things that, that have worked for me, one is um, instead of just asking how was your day, ask them how was your online day. And I don't say it in those words because my son would be like, what are you talking about? So I'll say like, hey, what was the funniest meme you saw today? Or did anything piss you off today on, online? And things like that. And over time, he'll be like, oh, let me show you this meme. Or this guy said this stupid thing. It really has like brought out those conversations. And then the other thing is very similar, but um, there was a time when he was overtaken by Fortnite, which I'm sure some of you can understand, and it, we just lost him. And it was also the time he was 13, so he was like breaking away, so I got that. <coughs> but he wasn't talking to me at all, and we'd always been very close. And one day I just spontaneously said, why do you love Fortnite so much? I don't get it. And he sat next to me for an hour and talked about Fortnite. The next morning, I woke up to a PowerPoint about Fortnite. <laughs> and to this day, when he's playing whatever, he'll call me in the room and go, look at this cool thing I just did, or I won, or whatever. And it's like, I don't think that would have happened if I hadn't just asked that question. So really showing interest and not just being all the time like, get off of that Fortnite, but like showing interest in it really opens those doors. Yeah. yeah, I think our kids are tired of us being the experts on everything. Yeah. You know, when, if you turn them into the expert, you're going to get so much more out of them. With the, mm -hmm. I think as Susan puts so if you put power in their hands to bring their world to you, mm -hmm. as opposed to you trying to come into their world and barge in and break down the door, if you invite them to, to ask, ask them about their world mm -hmm. and to share it with you, and be the expert, to teach me something, I find that opens up a lot of conversations. You're, I mean, that's a description of what like just good teaching looks like. Like as a cl classroom practitioner, like yeah, that's good teaching. Like take it, find find your kids' passion, mm -hmm. and like when's the last like when's the next time your kids gonna make a PowerPoint and like give a one hour? <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Now Cheryl shared a magic trick that she does with uh, the misery scale. Does anybody else have a magic trick that they use to open up a conversation without it feeling like pressure? I have one that I want to share. <laughs> Um, I do high-low check-in, so tell me, instead of saying, how was your day, tell me the high of your day, tell me the low of your day, and that really gets them talking instead of, oh, it's good, you get a yeah. lot of high -low. Or you can do like rose and thorn. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Or my wife likes to do, what, 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 give me three things I don't know that happen. So that, again, gets them to say, anybody else have a magic trick they like to play at the dinner thing? If I could um, add something, um, Danielle took the pathways. Um, it was really interesting when um, y'all were talking about the best way to talk about your feelings um, with your kids and getting the um, communication and making it natural and talking about it. And I think with parents, the hardest thing is when they don't communicate right and shut you out or they kind of like, it was fine and they're on the phone and they're talking to so-and-so, right? Or I think the, the father in the front row, row was talking about his, his daughter and the issue with the internet, and she was just, I'm gonna take care of it right here. Um, you know, a, a lot of that's all for protection, self-preservation. A lot of times when kids um, um, don't feel upfront with us always, it's um, a way to protect themselves. It's a way to protect their parents. It's a way sometimes to not disappoint their parents or to keep you always thinking of them in the best light, keeping you happy, keeping your day, you know, moving, moving smooth. Um, kids are really in tune to you as 
well as you are to them. And so keeping things light, keeping things moving, all of that is definitely like the lovely panelists are saying. And um, this is a lovely conversation. I just really want to add to that. that a lot of times we don't, we don't see it as a protective measure or self-preservation. We see it as they're ignoring us or they don't want to maybe share. But a lot of times it is something different. A lot of times it's different. One of, one of the strategies I, I remember hearing about for my, in my last district when I came to trying to approach a child with a, a hobby that was outside of the parents' comfort or knowledge of was um, you know, finding some moments at the end of the day to say, I thought about you today when X. And drawing that back to what they had seen as a passion in their kid. And that was a way to validate what the child was enjoying. Um, and then again, it, it need, these conversations are rapidly going away from just being technology specific to just like strategies to have relationships with your kids. Um, but um, I remember having families and then talking when I was at the building administrator with the kids even, um, that kids appreciated hearing those little snapshots of my, my, my adults were thinking about me when I wasn't in the room. And that's not something that necessarily registers with them because we, um, but it, it, it can be, it can be great for your kids and for you too. Okay. So switching back to technology, to the, to the, the amount of time our kids may spend on technology, on screens. So let's discuss some of the best ways to introduce controls and time management for your child's use of technologies. And then I have a second part to that. But what are, what are the, you know, every time you download a new, um, App on Smart TV. It says, "Here's the parental controls. What do you want to? You know, how do you want to set these?" So, can we talk a little bit about? Um, you know, we do keep our kids safe when they can't swim. We put a floaty on them, and uh, you know, we, we do put protections in place that they may resist or that we know better are going to keep them safe. So, there are some things about technology that um, we probably need to put some management around. I can share a little bit. Um, it's part of my job. Uh. <laughs> Uh, if you're jotting down URLs or general, something for y'all to, to get down, um, cctkater.net slash technology at home um, has a couple of links to uh, some third party resources. You know, a lot of the anxiety for, st for st students and children um, is on their phones, and um, both Google and Apple um, have invested in the last couple of years pretty heavily in. Um, baking in parental controls um, at the app level, screen time controls, and actually your, web, your website, I took a look, has yeah. some nice screenshots. Um, the, fr the frustrating part is you know, Apple and Google continue to change up the user interface and the user experience to make it better. Um, so uh, if, if you look at a pictorial guide, there might be some idiosyncrasies where it doesn't quite match up with your device. Um, but they continue to improve. Um, and think what you will about, you know, Apple and I got my Google phone here. Um, it, it is significant that they invest a tremendous amount of their engineering resources um, into all, all kinds of elements of, of, of health. <coughs> it's, it'd be great if it had been there at the beginning, but it's, it's there now. I, I think we can continue to expect it to improve. Um, but you'll find links to those apps and resources um, from the Educator website. And um, I mean, frankly, if you go to a you go to your search engine of choice for phone app controls, those resources will be near, near, near the top. Um, one, of, one of our tenants, in, when it comes to security, which is a little bit different approximate to monitoring and whatnot, is uh, defense in depth. So you can make some adjustments, you can put some apps and make some connections on at the phone level. Um, there are other resources out there uh, that you might consider um, for your home internet infrastructure. Um, depending on your internet service provider, you may or may not be able to um, uh, route your traffic through particular third-party uh, services, some of which are free. Um, that would give you some monitoring, some of the content filtering even that we have in place um, under the law and as a public school district. Um, those are all, I mean, those are technology rewards. Um, kids are really, really good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Cheryl does this too, working at Decatur High School. Kids are good about getting around whatever technology ward you put in place. It started with the baby-proof locks, 
and they're just going to keep on going. Yep. Um, and so, and the, so an, another part of, of the monitoring comes back to really what we were just discussing, and that is your norms as a family and what your expectations are. It's like any, it should look and sound pr pretty close to any other rule and expectation in the household, um, including mutual expectations. Um, you know, when your devices are out as a family, when they're not. Um, I think it is good to have those conversations about what is working or not working well with technology, not just when it is bad, so, but also when it is going well. Like, again, like what's the best meme you saw today or what's something funny that's happening to your friends online? Because um, that can then be the springboard to that piece of monitoring and that conversation that a report from a third party tool might not necessarily catch or might not catch in a way that is meaningful to you. Um, one thing to caution against is, is if you, you know, put in place one of these filtering services and it says, you know, child search for these particular terms, uh, and this is true for like school rules too, investigate before you decide like what happens, what happens next. Again, like have the conversation and come at it from a place of support and wanting to understand because um, otherwise it's just going to make it harder the next time it happens. Um, I think some parents over here were talking about you have, uh, you know, kids who are in fifth grade or fourth grade and they're kind of entering that phase where you're asking yourself, like, what apps should they have? How much is too soon? Should they have a phone? Should they just have a touch? That kind of stuff. Um, having had three kids, you know, one's freshman in college, one's in high school, one's in middle school, um, all three of them are different and I haven't done the exact same thing for all three. So the first thing is that my kids understand like fair and equal are not the same thing. You know, um, my oldest was very different. He spent his sophomore year abroad and he had his phone and he had parents that were not me. And when he came back from that experience, he was handling his business. He was fine. He was whatever. He got to keep his phone, you know, whatever. My next child. Um, is more uh, tempted by it, is just more drawn to it, is more drawn to technology, and so I still at night have a hard rule, 1030, you turn in your phone, because I know if, so, but it's not about like the phone is evil, it's about, because we, you know, the jury's still out on all this. We don't have enough to say like this. Here's what I do know, almost without a doubt, sleep is good. <laughs> for adolescents. So my premise for why I take your phone at 10.30 is not because your phone is bad, it's because sleep is good. And I know that if you have something lit in your face right before, that you will not sleep, that you will stay up to stream or whatever. And so I think that, like, or being outside is good. Like, being in nature is good for people. Being around trees, being in fresh air, exercise is good. So it's not about the phone is bad, it's about if it's keeping you from doing the things that are good in more abundance. So I think setting rules along that, like what I want for you, not just what I don't want for you, is a good way. And then the question about the apps and such, like I, I can only offer like what my rules are, but things like I have the passwords to my kids' phones, there's no expectation from them that like I might not, you know, look at their phone at some point. I have like the basic stuff like Verizon family where I can see like how many texts and calls they've had and at what times of day so that if, you know, I do see something late at night or whatever. I mean, but I don't have like the Bark or the 360 because I, def I feel like that might be for some kids like really what is needed and I think when things happen, sometimes that's when you need to decide like if there's a reason to distrust or whatever. But I also think it's almost from, you know, as Esten's pointing out, you could spend all of your time looking for the thing. You know, and if, if you're spending all your time looking for the thing to prove a negative, what aren't you, you know, I, it's kind of like, how do you want to spend your time? Uh, being the police or being the person that has a good enough relationship that you know, you can have these conversations proactively. Um, it's hard, though, to I, know. I would suggest, as you're considering it, having conversations with your children about what apps to install if they get to the point where you want to provision them a phone. Um, take a very serious look at privacy. Mm -hmm. um, as Cheryl can tell you, having waited weeks for me to review 
application terms of service and privacy requirements. Um, it is mind-bogglingly stitching and awful. Um, and you don't necessarily need to do it. Um, there are folks out there who have done the vetting and who are um, looking at um, privacy for um, what these uh, vendors, what these uh, app publishers um, will do with um, any data that, that they collect. Um, Common Sense, we're Decatur, um, we're part of a consortium with Common Sense Media. Um, we invest and we benefit from other school districts evaluation of privacy policies. Um, there, uh, I'm drawing a blank on another group. There's a, there's a student data privacy pledge, which doesn't cover all the bases, um, but is a good indicator that a company takes privacy seriously. They tend to only be like education related companies and not necessarily gamers and whatnot. Um, and I gotta tell you, like, the, what the app space looks like outside of the education world, I, I don't know. I'm afraid to go to look. Thankfully, we don't install those on our computers. Um, but that, I mean, just as it is for you, and you take some common sense protections for your own privacy, um, I think you, you owe that to your kids. If, if they don't have an appreciation of it, help educate them about that and work with them to make sure that they're not wanting to put something on a device that is going to um, buy them later or just, or just compromise them in a way that is unhealthy for anyone. Yeah, just to add on to what they've said, um, it's definitely depending on each kid, but I do think there's some hard and fast rules. One is if they're on a social platform, their account should be private. Yes. Dead stop. No, no public. Um, and some families that we work, that I've worked with um, have done a contract, and they work with their kid to come up with the rules and regulations and what happens if you don't follow them, and then everybody signs it. And that seems to work for some people. Um, you mentioned common sense media. Um, one of the things I tell parents is know the apps that are on your kid's phone. Um, you have to know what it does, how it works, and all of that. And I usually have, like, I call it the trilogy, where it's, I use the um, restrictions that come with the phone, whether it's screen time, family link on Google, whatever it is. Use those the way it works best for your kid. And then use some kind of control, like whether it be circle, bark, anything, depending, it again, on your child and what you need. And then physically check the phone. You really have to. Um, and I don't mean read every text. I mean just glance at it. Um, I've caught some things that I probably wouldn't have if I didn't. Um, and I've had parents call me in a panic because their kid was doing something, they never even looked at the phone, and then they got in trouble. So it's a really fine line of privacy, and I get it. I think it's more important for the younger kids. Like when my kid was 13, that's when the trouble was. And I started looking at his phone a lot. And now he's 16, and I think I look at it like twice every month because I trust him more and he's learned a lot of lessons. So um, I could talk about safety and security all night, but those are the things that I think, you know, the three things that you need to think about, especially with younger ones who have just started, because, man, they get on there and it's like, woo, no holds barred. But, you know, we have to make sure that we're talking to them and not jump into conclusions when you find something. Yes. So I think it's interesting when we talk about the privacy side of things, right? And we're all saying, oh, well, I'm going to check my child's phone, you know, periodically like that. You know, as they get older, you run into the situations of, okay, I took your phone, I checked it. Well, now I know that Lila's selling drugs to all the friends, and I know that Billy just slept with three girls who I know their parents. Now what am I supposed to do with that information, <laughs> right? And, and those are all kind of hard dynamics um, to figure out as they get older, and you start to see whatever kind of information you might see uh, on a kid's phone. Um, you know, the other part is, I think, too, is that when they have their phones, you know, they have access to, well, I'll even use, you know, CSD as, a, as a, a, an example of, you know, the kind of, um, you know, it's very common for them to begin to interact with teachers and other adults and things like that. I see it a lot um, when they get involved in sports where, they have a Snapchat group with their coach and the kids, and then sometimes it just goes from coach to player and things like that. And, you know, I'm sure 99% of it is probably just good, honest, straightforward communication, but I, I think there's all kinds of other channels that can open up that um, should be looked at and monitored in those processes and things like that. I'll, I'll just tell you here for everyone that's some useful feedback. Um, 
And one of the things that we did this year is we rolled out a, mess a, a bulk messaging tool for um, our schools to begin using that is auditable. Um, this is the first year that we've put it out in place. It's the same Blackboard messaging tool that's bringing new newsletters and whatnot. It's replaced our emergency communications. But it also scales down to like the classroom level. It's not to the point yet where it's in our coaches' hands, particularly our coaches who might not also be faculty members, but that's on the roadmap to expand access to. Yeah. Um, and that's not born out of anxiety about something that's necessarily happened on Snapchat, but I, what I hear in, in you sharing that observation is the potential for like, anxiety or concern. Mm -hmm. And if we, can just, if we can remove that, then that's, that's worthwhile. Well, well, I think it does a couple of things. One, all of a sudden when a, a coach or a teacher says, well, it's okay, for me to email you, it, you know, in a child's mind, they could perceive that to say, well, it's okay if any 45-year-old man texts me or emails me, and it's simply not, right? Or, or you know, there's, again, there's, there's very hard areas. Well, if the 45-year-old person is the grandparent, well, then maybe it is, you know, or the uncle or something like that. But it, it just opens up those things where I, I think we just need to... Boundaries. Boundaries of, of, yes. of you know, what you might think and... And That's hard. interesting when you just said that about Team Snap because I'm on Team Snap for like my daughter's mm -hmm. teams, and it never really occurred to me that like because it's usually parents, sure. right, messaging each other, but that you know if they did have a coach who's messaging, that's an interesting dynamic. I hadn't yeah. thought of that. It, it, and they do it like they do it a lot from coach to players. You know, it's mostly practice got switched to five, yeah, not right. six, or something like yeah. that. But it's. Uh, and, and while you guys were, when you mentioned that about what if you see something that concerns you, and I know I did see a lot of hands go up of parents with older children in the high schools, um, that is one reason why we got started with the parent network, was so that we could have those conversations. So if Joel sees something on there and knows that, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of of the same mindset you are, it's okay to call and we'll talk about this, and it's... It's not that you're trying to get anybody in trouble, but the early, if a child is using and we see something on social media and we want to inform the parents, you're much better off knowing before your child hits 17 and you're looking at them no longer being considered a juvenile. It is much easier to get these kids help when they're young. So... It's, it's horrible when you see stuff like that, but I do want to just step in and just remind you guys that that's something that with the Parent Network, we try and help you navigate that. I had one um, group of moms that I talked to that did exactly that. Um, they had a little tight-knit group of guys, and they were getting into the social media, and the moms all got together and decided we're all going to have the same rules, and we're all going to agree that if we see something, we're going to say something. So if you see my kid did this, you're going to tell me and vice versa. And it really worked well for them. And, and it kind of took the pressure off. Like you see that and you're like, like you said, and you're like, oh my gosh, now what do I do? And I've actually had moms call me and say, I saw this, now what do I do? And I say, call the parents. And if you're on the parents network, you can actually go into the listserv. Y'all probably didn't know this, but you can actually go into the listserv to remember Planet. Um, if you're a member, and you can see all the other parents who are members, and there's usually contact information in there for them. So that kind of helps you already know that we've kind of all agreed to this. We may not have looked each other in the face and agreed to it, but we have agreed to this as members of the Parent Network. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add that um, exactly what oh I wanted to add that exactly what you're saying about how kids now. Um, you see on their phones that there's something um, potentially unsafe going on with one of their friends. Um, I mean, I see discussions among therapists about how this is yet another stressor that nowadays our kids are relying on each other to be mental health counselors. And that is a huge burden for our kids to carry. And it's one that they shouldn't have to carry. It's just adding to their stress and anxiety. So I wanted to add that um, I know that at Decatur High, the counselors have been notified, I know of at least two situations, where there were concerns about safety that, um, you know, a kid or a couple kids found out about a friend and they, you know, either, you know, the kids or a parent of the kids 
contacted the counselors and the counselors you know, checked in with the kid they were concerned about and the kid's family to make sure that they were safe and that there was a plan. So you don't, if you don't feel comfortable sure. approaching the other parent, it, am I correct yeah. that, 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 that yeah. you go, go to you all call. and let you all know? Call the, we call uh, Dr. The Jones is just, mm -hmm. just hand it off. Well, because and and we've been trained to do, deal with it. Mm -hmm. And we've been working in the in the Marty and I both. I work in the seventh, so she works in the sixth and eighth. And talk to the kids about you'd rather lose a friendship than a friend. Um, and you know, as a parent who's gotten that call from one of their friends and says, "I'm worried about your daughter," you know, it's a hard call to take. But boy, what a gift! Boy, what a gift! And I think to the point of normalizing conversation around this, as I said earlier, my 18-year-old said, well, I'm going to turn to my friend first if I'm having a difficult time or, or whatever. And they aren't mental health professionals, but they do have a trust factor. And so do you want to try to leverage that trust factor um, to getting a solution? So the more we normalize conversation around these things, the, the less of a bubble that they're in with their friends, the more knowledge that, that the teens have about resources or places to go or ways to help, it opens up opportunities to leverage that trust into a more safe place. I'll share that um, my last school district was in Palo Alto um, at the time that we, um, we had a suicide cluster. The CDC came out and did a study. And part of the um, follow-up we did with our kids was around that exact idea, that, that issue. That often, often the kids' peers were their, were their go-to resource. And so it was really important in our community um, to have the conversation with the kids about, you know, when your friend goes to you, who is your go-to adult? Mm -hmm. And if it's okay, if it's okay if it's not me, but I need you to like name me two or three people. Mm -hmm. um, and then if if you're the one in distress, who who are your go-to people if it's not me? And again, like that's part of the normal, like normalize those check-ins. Yep. Who are your go-to grown-ups? That's y'all's homework. Go home <laughs> and say, hey, who is a trusted adult in your school? And have them ju not just say, oh, it's my teacher. Oh, name it's my counselor. Teacher. We need to know the name. So if you're getting su some suspicions, you can go to that person because you already know that that stakeholder is connected to your child and say, hey, you know what? So and so, my child is not, there's something off. I'm not really sure what it is. Can we talk about this? Did you notice anything at school? Um, so I would, that's your homework. Go home and ask your kids who is a trusted adult at school, or it could be on the soccer field, it could be in drama, it could be in art. Um, make sure that there's somebody else, an adult in their life that, you know, is important. I was at a training once and they called that, who is your battle buddy? Who is your battle buddy? Um, who, who, who's got your back on this? And I use that with my son still. Who's, you know, I'm your battle buddy, everything else, but who else is, who else is going to be your battle buddy? Something okay, that, are there any other questions from, uh, I, I have one or two little yeah. things to ask the team, but is there any questions we're not getting to that people want to ask? Yeah, I, haven't, um, I just wanted to say thanks for having this panel, because it is, I think, like we said at the beginning, this is a big experiment that we're conducting with this generation. We have no idea of getting some evidence from studies, but we we are making decisions before we've assessed the evidence. Hopefully our kids will be better. And, <laughs> so, and the people who are profiting from our children having foes are don't have our children's best interests at heart. They have profits at heart. Exactly. How do we as parents with our busy lives stand up? against those marketing executives and psychologists who are being paid six-figure salaries to figure out how to get us and our children addicted. So I feel like it's a really tough situation and we have to work together to combat it. I feel like um, as a parent of three kids, one in college, one as a junior, one is in seventh grade, this has been the toughest challenge of parenting that I have faced. Mm -hmm. Dealing with this addiction and the, all of the issues, we haven't even talked about how it replaces reading, mm -hmm. you know, which is 
when you look at the statistics since the, the 70s, there is a huge drop-off in reading. How do we raise kids who are smart enough and well-informed enough about history and um, philosophy and so on to make good decisions and be good citizens? Um, I think the high school is doing an awesome job in that. And I just wanted to give a shout-out to Cheryl Namian, who <laughs> got my... Um, Sophomore in college, to where he is now. So thank you so much for all you did for him, um, and all the other teachers too. But um, I feel like when I look at this conversation, I see scales. I see reasons to have a smartphone on this side, and reasons not to have a smartphone on this side. I'm seeing this side going like this, and I don't really see anything on this side at all. The reason I gave my boys a smartphone, which I waited till 10th grade for number one, and probably it was eighth, no, it was ninth grade for number two. Why did I give them smartphones? Because their friends had smartphones. Why, why did I have to do that? Because then suddenly I was fighting all these battles. You're not reading any books, you're spending less time outside, you're looking at memes all day, which are stupid and meaningless. <laughs> And it's a waste of your brain, never mind the pornography that you have probably seen. You know, I don't know how many people read the article the other day about um, the 11-year-old girl who was exposed to pornography at a party because when the boys were standing around looking at a violent gang rape and laughing. I encourage everybody to read that story and also the, the recent story by Bark, which you all have mentioned, which is about this group goes undercover, they work with law enforcement, and they pose as, as young girls. They open Instagram accounts. Yeah, I've read that and just recently. Then that, that article, I just felt ill reading yeah. it. You know, the, the men who immediately hopped on as soon as that woman posed as an 11-year-old girl and started talking about, um, you know, exposing themselves, sending photos of their private parts. And, um, you know, Again, another reason not to go there, because how can we possibly po police it? And um, the social skills, the bullying, like you said, the amplification of things we all do as humans. Yeah. Of course, it amplifies good things as well. When Facebook first came out, and the Arab Revolution in, in Syria, and, and all of those Middle Eastern countries that were able to get that message out through Facebook, of, look what's happening in our country. But why, why are we giving our children smartphones? What are the reasons for it? I am struggling to think of one good reason for a child to have a smartphone. I mean, I'm actually thinking of giving up my smartphone, which will be a sacrifice for my work, just to, in solidarity because my, my junior said, Mom, this time last year he said to me, Mom, I don't have Instagram. I don't feel like a complete person because I don't have Instagram. And we talked through it together, and he agreed finally. Okay, I'm okay not having Instagram. But you could see that all of his friends were just wasting their time and looking through this stuff and getting anxious. So he's okay with it now. We, we were tough and we toughed it out together. And I think it comes back to your comment about connection. Because if I wasn't connecting with him emotionally, that would have been a disaster. But, um, and I'm probably not doing everything that I should to connect. But um, I'm just wondering. Um, so he said this year, take away my smartphone, take away my iPhone, let's do a flip phone. So we've ordered them, and I'm going to probably, you know, switch as well, which is a little awkward, as I said, at work, because I'm not going to be that cool employee who can immediately respond to emails. But, you know, they shouldn't be placing those expectations. But I do work in public health, um, and this is a big part of why I started my question with, what is the evidence to give your child a smartphone? In 1950, my grandmother was told to smoke by her doctor, mm -hmm. okay? Because her husband had died and they said, this would be good for your health. We're, here we are in 2020, we know what tobacco does and we have like a public health program in place to combat the tobacco industry. That took how long? 50 years? Do we need to wait 50 years to sort of take action on this? But I mean, for me, I'm just saying, why do we, why do we do it? Or am I just living on, you know, in la la land, saying that we don't have to? 
I think it comes back to something you said about parents banding together and agreeing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of um, parents doing that now. There's groups on Facebook and the Wait Till 8th. I don't know if I've seen that program. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, but I'm so, like, wait till 12. Yeah. You know? I well, really want to know why do we do it? What uh, are the I can tell you why I did. It's not a good reason, but I'll be honest why I did. My son had a flip phone. As I mentioned, he was the last one to get a smartphone in ninth grade. Um, and he was missing out on a lot because the kids only talk on Snapchat. Mm -hmm. There's no texting. There's no, God forbid, they don't call someone. Yeah. Um, you say that and look we'll like you're crazy. So all these conversations with his friend groups were going on on Snapchat, which he did not have. And I noticed him sitting home a lot and getting, you know, so that was anxiety too because he was missing out on things and he got really upset about it. And so I gave in. Was it the right thing to do? I don't know, but. But then the cause wasn't um, your son not integrating or being able to socially relate to his friends. It was because all his friends were exactly. on their smartphones. Mm -hmm. So again, it comes back to like, for all of you guys with younger children, just try to influence this entire community to say, you know, until we have evidence, let's not do this. Anyway, I don't want to hug this, but no, I just feel like let's, let's peel back our assumptions and go to the root causes of why we're doing this. Yeah, I just think that the more you make it taboo, because it, it is a part of our culture now, we cannot take that away. And if 99% if, if of our children are doing it, and we make it taboo, and we don't make it build a healthy, dynamics around the relationship of what is already existing in our environment, then it's, 